Welcome to the Chronicles, told by the Oracle. Cases of the missing, murdered, and unsolved. I'd like to thank everyone for joining me today. And as always, you can find source information at thecertifiedroracle.com. And be sure you hit that like and subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Let's get started with Chronicle number 45. The Burger Chef Murders Journey back to 1978. Ben and Jerry's opened their first ice cream shop, not yet knowing they would one day dominate the ice cream industry. The first primetime Super Bowl aired, where the Dallas Cowboys would defeat the Denver Broncos 27-10. Stephen King would publish The Stand, an 832-page book based on a nasty outbreak of the influenza virus. How true that book would ring in 2019. Garfield would make his comic debut, where the fun-loving lasagna-eating cat would be around for decades to come. The all-new Laserdisc was introduced and would change the way we viewed movies and music. Louise Brown was born, and she was the first test tube baby. She was conceived via in vitro fertilization, making way for parents everywhere to have the chance at conception. Meanwhile, in the Ohio Valley, a three-day blizzard swept across the state with record-high snowfall. It would end up killing 51 with snowdrifts up to 15 feet. All of the exciting things happening in 1978 did not matter anymore. Four families were grieving the loss of their children, and police were eager to find the person or persons responsible. However, it would not prove to be as easy as police originally had thought. Burger Chef was an American fast food restaurant which opened its doors in 1954 in Indianapolis, Indiana. It quickly expanded throughout the United States. It had over 1,000 locations, including some in Canada, by the 1970s. Frank and Donald Thomas had patented the flame broiler and introduced the world to the flame broiled patty. This would cause the chain to be known for its signature Big Chef and Super Big Chef burgers. The chain would even introduce the fun burger and the fun meal. This was a kid's meal that was introduced before McDonald's Happy Meal. It had small toys and puzzles with booklets about the brothers' adventures in it. In fact, Burger Chef was not pleased when McDonald's introduced the Happy Meal, as it was a knockoff of their fun meal, and Burger Chef would take them to court, ultimately losing and allowing McDonald's to keep the Happy Meal name. In 1982, Burger Chef sold to a Canadian company who owned Hardee's, another fast food chain. Most of the Burger Chefs would be converted into Hardee's, and the legacy of the fun meal and Super Chef would live on in the minds of those lucky enough to have known the burger chain before it vanished forever. If you ask someone nowadays if they know what Burger Chef is, the answer most often given is no. However, the few that do remember Burger Chef is not for the delicious burgers, but for the 1978 murders of four young employees on November 17th. Jane Jane Carol Freet was born on May 2, 1958, to George and Carolyn. Jane had one sister, Joanne, and three brothers, James, Joseph, and David. Jane was a very smart 20-year-old young woman, living on her own and working as the assistant manager at the Speedway Indiana Burger Chef. Jane had been employed by the chain since she was 17 years old, and had worked her way up the ladder, which in the 70s was not easy as a female. Jane had only been at the Speedway location for three months, but had already proved she was more than ready for her own store. She would work upwards of 52 hours a week and was very dedicated to her job. She was known to all as Sweet Jane. Everyone Jane saw, she would have a kind word to say to them, and if you were having a bad day, she was known to cheer you up and put a smile on your face. All who knew her loved her and had nothing but kind words to say. However, before Jane would be able to have her own store and pursue all that life had to offer her, hers would be cut short one early fall morning in November. Ruth Ellen Ruth Ellen Shelton was born on December 19, 1960 to John and Rachel. 
Ruth attended Northwest High School in Indianapolis, Indiana, where she was an honor student and participated in the STEM program, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. This was a program most young ladies steered away from in the 1970s. But for Ruth Ellen, it was something that interested her very much. She had planned to study computer science in college. This young lady was already planning her future at just 17. However, her life would be taken on that early November morning, and her family would never know what her life could have been. Mark Mark Sylvester Flemons was born on December 31, 1961, to Robert and Blondell. Mark was the youngest of seven children, who were all raised in a devout Jehovah's Witness home. When Mark started his freshman year at Decatur Central High, he had a rough time getting settled into high school life. But by his junior year, when he was 16 years old, things seemed to turn around for Mark. Robert had agreed to let his son work at the burger chef because it was in walking distance of their home. Mark was new to the night shift and had only switched the week before, when Speedway High School senior Diana Dillon had quit. Mark usually did not work on Friday nights. However, on November 17th, Ginger Haggard, who was a 17-year-old that worked with Mark, had asked him if she would switch shifts with her on Friday night as she had made plans to go on a date with another employee, Brian Kring. Mark, the nice short-order cook that he was, agreed and was now on the schedule for Friday night. At the last minute, Mark tried to get out of the shift, but went in as it was the right thing to do. A few weeks before, Robert had ordered Mark to quit the burger chef, as he felt Mark had become too involved with a young lady, and he felt Mark did not need that kind of distraction. When the young lady quit, not long after Robert had ordered his son to quit, he had allowed Mark to go back as she was no longer working there, and the distraction seemed to be gone. Looking back, Robert wishes he would have never let his son go back to work at the burger chef, as he believes he would have still been alive if he had not allowed him to go back to work. Daniel Daniel Roy Davis, known as Danny, was born on September 6, 1962. Danny was a junior at Decatur High School where he had a passion for photography. He had created his own dark room where he would develop his own pictures. After high school, Danny planned to enter the Air Force. Danny loved to tell jokes and make people laugh. He brought an air of comedy and fun to his co-workers at Burger Chef. On November 17th, Danny had changed out of his uniform for the night as closing was almost complete. He gathered up the trash and headed out to the dumpsters not knowing his life would end that early morning. Friday, November 17, 1978, was a normal night shift for assistant manager Jane Free. The 20-year-old had a staff of three that night, 17-year-old Ruth Ellen, 16-year-old Mark Flemons, and 16-year-old Danny Davis. The crew took their last customers of the night before closing up at 11 p.m. Between 11 p.m. Friday and 12 a.m. on Saturday, something sinister had happened, but no one knew exactly what. A little after midnight, Brian Kring and his date, both employees of the Burger Chef, were on their way back from their date when the female noticed Jane's white Chevy Vega was not in the parking lot. Brian had remembered an employee had called in and said their van was broken down and they could not come into work that night. He remembers this as he had told Jane he would come by and help them close up Friday after his date. After the 17-year-old dropped his date and co-worker off at her home, he returned back to the restaurant. Knowing the front door would be locked, he drove around to the back. The first thing he noticed was the back door ajar. Upon parking, he entered the store, hollered out, and got no response. He then checked the entire store. No one was there. He went into the manager's office and found the safe open with only the rolled change left, and noticed that both Jane and Ruth Ellen had left their purses and jackets. He knew something was not right and called the police. While Brian waited for the police to arrive, another off-duty employee showed up to the store. This was the employee who had called off that night as he said his van was not running. It has been said that Danny was not supposed to close that night, but had called and asked his mom if he could because the person whose van was not running had called off and they would be short-handed. She agreed. 
which is something she has much guilt about. As soon as Brian told the employee he had called the police, the employee took off in a haste. It should be noted the employee who called off that night has never been named. Not much can be found on this employee, to my knowledge. Mark was not supposed to be working that night either. He was actually covering for the girl who was on a date with Brian. These changes in scheduling would change the lives of everyone involved that night. When the police arrived, they found two bank bags that were empty, an empty roll of tape next to the safe that was open wide in the office. Police would call the store's head manager, which is what we would call a general manager today, a man named Robert Gilyeet. When Robert arrived, he tallied the days and nights sales and discovered nearly $600 was missing from the store. The police saw no signs of forced entry and no signs of a struggle. It was truly an odd and confusing scene for everyone. The police would dust for prints, however, no pictures of the scene were taken. At the time, police speculated the teens had taken the money and went on a joyride, and they would be back by morning hungover and apologetic. However, Robert Gilly knew his employees and knew all of them were good, solid kids who had no history of getting into trouble. They were all very responsible, and he knew the kids did not steal anything. The police would question Brian about the door and what he had seen the night he arrived. He cooperated with police, and once questioned, he told them the back door stays locked at all times unless someone is taking the trash out to the dumpster. Then it would be propped open or someone would hold it open until the person was done. The police determined he was not involved in this crime and was cleared. In the weeks leading up to the Burger Chef crime, Speedway, Indiana was hit with a series of crimes and a murder. 65-year-old Julia Cipher was shot to death in her garage while showing items she had for sale. On Saturday, July 29, 1978, Fred, Julia's husband, answered the door to a man with long dark hair around 3 p.m. The man asked for his wife. The man was there to see the items for sale. Julia had received a call a week prior from whom she assumed was the man standing on her porch. He had set up a time and never showed to look at the items. It was neither here nor there to her, and she still had the items, so she might as well show them to the man. The pair headed to the garage. Fred would stay inside their home. After the two were in the garage a few minutes, Fred heard a loud noise. Worried, he went to check on his wife. As he was coming out of the home, he saw the man backing out of his driveway in a white two-door vehicle and speeding off. Fred went to the garage to check on Julia, only to be met with a horrific scene. Julia was lying in a pool of her own blood next to the couple's Cadillac. The police were called. An ambulance had transported Julia to the hospital, where she was pronounced dead forty minutes later. Fred was devastated, and the police were baffled. Who would want to kill Julia? Police would say this looked to be a professional hit job. The police would go on to discover there was a feud between Julia and a man named Brett Kimberlin. Julia had a daughter who worked for this man. Brett was getting a little too flirty and close with Julia's granddaughter who was only 14 years old. Julia was not going to have that. Julia let her granddaughter move in with her to keep her safe. By September 1, 1978, police were dealing with loud explosion calls. This was something new. The police had never gotten that kind of call before. Three explosions would take place, one outside of the Speedway bowling alley. The next was beneath an off-duty police officer's cruiser, and finally the third one, which injured three, went off in the high school parking lot. Police would notice how poorly made the bombs appeared to be and were able to track down a piece used for the detonator. When they tracked down where it was sold, they discovered it was Brett Kimberlin who had purchased the piece, and police assumed he was the one who set the bombs off. Along with Brett, William Bowman would be charged in connection with Julia's murder, as it was believed he was hired by Brett to kill her. It would be three years before the connection was made between the bombings and the murder, but police said they were connected. It should be noted nothing I could find was elaborated on as to why the two were connected other than the two involved knew each other. This murder in 1978 had everyone on edge. They could not know the horrors four families would face by November of 1978. The murder of Julia Cyphers would have the town leery of everyone. 
It would also prompt Carolyn to talk to her daughter about safety, as she lived on her own and she was the closing manager of a very busy Burger Chef location. Jane would tell her mom she was not scared, even after one of the bombs had went off across the street from the store. She told her mom if someone tried to hold up the restaurant, she would not fight, she would give them what they wanted. Was this what had conspired on the night of November 17th? Had someone tried to rob the place and something went wrong? The police would not believe anything nefarious had happened until they found Jane's 1974 white Chevy Vega at 4.30 a.m. Saturday morning, hours after they were called to the Burger Chef. The car was abandoned in a parking lot two blocks from the Speedway Police Station. The driver's side door was locked. It should be noted Carolyn said this was normal. Jane kept her door locked at all times, even when she drove. The passenger side door was unlocked, and the keys to the vehicle were nowhere to be found. The police found a few clues in or around the Chevy Vega. By the time the vehicle was found, the families had been alerted that their children were missing. John Shelton remembers getting the call around 1 a.m. He always waited up for Ruth Ellen to call and tell him she was on her way so he could open the garage door for her. This time it was police telling him Ruth Ellen and three other employees were missing from work. The police would call Robert Flemons. However, they asked him if Mark had come home from work yet. His dad told police no. The police said as soon as Mark arrived home, have him call the station. Odd, Robert thought. However, when Mark did not come home, Robert headed to the police station and asked what was going on. This is when he discovered the kids were missing. Why had police been vague with Mark's dad and asked if he was home yet? Did police believe Mark was somehow more involved than the rest of the employees? This is a question there is no answer to. On Saturday morning when the day crew arrived, they were simply told there was a robbery. The crew was then allowed to go inside and continue cleaning up from the night before so the restaurant could open. In doing this, all evidence was now gone. The families were on edge, and no one knew what happened to their kids, and they were clinging on to any hope they had left. Robert Flemons remembered a conversation he had with Mark while watching a movie one night. There was a kidnapping scene, and Mark told his father if that happened to him, he would find a way to escape. He said he would break away and weave and bob so it would be harder to hit him if they had a gun. This gave Robert hope that maybe his son had gotten away and was alive out there and just hurt somewhere. Two teens would come forward to police once they saw the news about Burger Chef. On November 17th, about an hour before Brian showed up at his work, another young man had been picking his girlfriend up from work. He was on foot and the two planned on walking home together. As the two cut through the Burger Chef parking lot, they noticed it was brightly lit and that the Chevy Vega was still in the parking lot. According to the teens, it was between 11 and 11.15 p.m. While the couple were sitting near the railroad tracks, two men approached them. Both men were white in their early to mid-thirties. Both men were dressed in shabby clothes. One man had long dark hair with a full beard and mustache. The man with the beard asked the teenage boy to identify himself. The bearded man talked with a handkerchief around his mouth and nose areas as if he was wiping his nose and talking at the same time, the teen girl would tell police. The other man was clean-shaven with lighter-colored hair and did not talk. Once the young man had told them they were only out there talking, the bearded man told the young teen to take his girlfriend home. He said it was not safe for them to be out here, as there had been a lot of vandalism in the area. The two teens left and thought nothing more of an interaction they had until they saw the four missing employees were from the same night as the two men had talked to them. The identity of the teenage couple has never been released to the public by law enforcement. Another young woman would come forward and claim on her way home from her boyfriend's on November 18th she drove past the burger chef around 12 a.m. as it was on her way home. She remembers seeing it lit up as if it were still open and thinking it was odd as she thought they closed earlier than that. Residents on Lupine Lane would come forward and say that in the early morning hours they had seen a car and a two-tone van racing through the neighborhood with their headlights off. One resident in the area of Lupine Street said she heard a scream as the vehicle passed by her home. Then she watched as both the car and the van came to an abrupt stop. One person got out of the van and went into the car. 
Others would say they remember the van and car, but that it slowed to a crawl when it got to the 3,000 block of Lupine Street before racing off again. It should be noted Lupine Street is where Ruth Ellen lived. John was up that night and said he heard nothing unusual, nor did he see a car in a van. On Sunday afternoon, the Indiana State Police received a call from Fred Heger. He and his wife were out on an afternoon walk around their property when they found the bodies of Ruth Ellen and Danny Davis, both lying face down in the dirt. Rosemary, Fred's wife, recognized the uniform that Ruth had on as a burger chef one and knew these were the kids who had gone missing. Fred called the police, who showed up as quickly as they could. The bodies were found on a small glen at the center of the woods. When police arrived, they found Danny and Ruth Ellen lying side by side, face down in the dirt. It appeared they had been shot. Jane was found a few yards away, lying in the opposite direction, and appeared she had been stabbed. Mark was found more than a hundred yards away. He appeared to have been beaten up, but there were no visible signs of gunshot or stab wounds on him. None of the victims were bound, and none of their clothing showed any signs of a struggle. Few clues came from the scene. At 4.45 p.m., Johnson County Coroner would arrive on the scene and pronounce all four victims dead. Dr. Harley Palmer would be performing the autopsies. The autopsies would show that Ruth Ellen and Daniel had been shot multiple times in the head, neck, and shoulders as they lie on the ground next to each other. Jane had been stabbed twice in the heart with a five-inch honey knife that was protruding out of her chest with a handle broken off. Mark had died from suffocating on his own blood. It appeared that Mark had been in a fight and beaten, but that was not the cause of his death. Dr. Palmer and police would come to the conclusion that Mark had gotten away from the killer or killers and ran into a tree, knocking himself out, when he landed in a position that caused his lungs to fill with blood, thus killing him. The police believed at this point that more than one person was responsible, and it was their job to figure out who. The police would hold a news conference where not many details were released. The police did tell reporters to focus their attention on Jane and Mark's death, as the circumstances surrounding their deaths were vital to the investigation. Nothing more was said as to why their murders were key. Burger Chef would announce they were offering a $25,000 reward. After this announcement, the local Steak and Shake offered up an additional $1,000 to that fund. Around this time, the Sheltons began receiving disturbing phone calls and a handwritten letter that they would turn over to the police. However, nothing would come of this. By the middle of December, police were in possession of another letter. This one police claimed could blow the whole case wide open. The only problem was they had to find out who had written the letter first. The letter was sent to the Indianapolis Star on November 29, 1978. The letter was written in blue ink on secretary paper, or what we know as a legal pad. The letter was signed, Dash 812. The letter claimed that there had been three people involved in the crime. It had started out as a robbery and then took a turn. This letter does not give an explanation for the cause of the murders. This letter does admit that a suspect the police had fired shots that killed Ruth and Daniel. The letter also claims a third person was responsible for stabbing Jane. It goes on to say the third person involved was only a bystander in the incident. This third person was in the car the entire time and was shocked the robbery ended in murder. The letter said the third person would confess for full immunity from the crime. According to the letter writer, the three men had split and no longer lived in Indiana. Two weeks later, a follow-up letter would arrive claiming to have important and confidential information on the case. Enclosed was a $1 bill that had been torn in half. The writer claimed this was how they would know it was him. The police never had the chance to find the man because the letter writer found them. He walked into the Indianapolis Star and wanted to talk to reporters. During the interview with reporters, the letter writer seemed to be very nervous. He told them his life and his family's life was in danger if his identity was revealed. The writer agreed to talk with police on the phone. After the phone call took place, Detective Jim Kramer met with the man at his home where the two spoke for an hour or more. The letter writer contradicted the letter the man the detective was talking to claimed there were only two people involved instead of three. 
The informant did give the names of the men and their last known addresses and the type of vehicle each man drove. Police became very interested in another letter that was sent. This letter claimed the writer could no longer help them anymore. It still claimed the third person was not involved in the murders and did not know it was going to happen. The kids were supposed to be tied up and left in the woods to be found the next day. The letter said the third person tried to stop the killings and yelled, Run, loudly, and then was beaten up badly for trying to alert the kids to run. The letter goes on to say he wishes the one that ran into the tree had not died, because if he had gotten away, police would have the killers locked up by now. The letter writer once again said the three men were no longer around each other as they had not seen each other since the murders, and all had moved out of the state of Indiana. It also said he hoped the inmate in Cincinnati knew the names of the other suspect. The letter closed with, I'm sorry, I can't help more than this, but I can't break a promise. The police had previously traveled to Cincinnati, Ohio. The informant there bore a resemblance to the bearded man. However, he said that was a coincidence. The informant in Cincinnati took and passed a polygraph, but detectives could not get over how much this man looked like the composite sketch. This informant also had an alibi for the night of November 17, 1978. The man would tell them that neither of the suspects intended on killing anyone that night. He said the suspects were forced to kill them when Ruth Ellen recognized one of the men. Police seemed to believe this man, however they left Cincinnati, and this was all that has been said about the interaction. As the holidays approached, detectives would take time off from the case and resume in January of 1979. The police would call in a psychologist to try and determine what kind of individual or individuals were capable of committing a crime like this. The psychologist would say the killers or killers were most likely on drugs at the time, and it was more of a thrill killing, especially if one of them were recognized. The psychologist believed the perpetrators were unproductive males between 16 years old and 25 years old, believing if they were on drugs it was supposed to be a quick robbery to get more drug money. As the end of January rolled around, police would make an announcement that they were now looking for a man in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and three men in Indianapolis, Indiana. The police believed this group of men were involved in drug trafficking and were also known to rob fast food establishments. One of the men police announced they were looking for was already in a Marion County jail. He seemed to know an awful lot about the murders. He was submitted to a polygraph. No results were released publicly and not much else was said about this man. It seemed the case was growing cold. Just when police believed the case was cold, state police investigator Ken York was pursuing a lead on two Johnson County men and a Southern Marion County man. The trio were involved in a number of fast food robberies. Detective York received a tip that on November 18, 1978, a Greenwood, Indiana man bragged in a bar about being involved in the Burger Chef murders. The man said the kids were in a wooded area out in the country and they would be found the next day. This man would give a version of events that police deemed plausible. The man was issued a polygraph and he passed, so police moved on. That was until February of 1980 when police would reinvestigate this man from Greenwood, who is now in a psychiatric ward. This man actually threw a 38 caliber gun out of his car on 21st Street in Cunningham on the night of the murders. It was a gun police had collected and put into evidence as they were not sure if it was connected to the Burger Chef case. This man was a known associate of a convicted robber. He also lived on the floor above Mark Flemons at the Big Eagle apartment complex. Not long after the murders, this man sought counseling for personal reasons. When police issued a polygraph to him, he was deemed to not be telling the truth on several questions. At this point, the police said this man, whom they called the Greenwood Gunman, was their prime suspect. The police were also interested in two other men, 26-year-old Timothy Bicconi and 29-year-old John DeFibal. When police questioned them, both would admit to robbing the Burger Chef at 444 East Summer Road and the Burger Chef on East Southport Road. The methods of robbery were the same as the Burger Chef on Crawfordsville Road, where the employees were that night. 
In both cases, the men accosted the crew members in the parking lot, forced them back into the store at gunpoint. Then they would make one crew member open the safe, taking the cash, before making all the crew members lie on the floor, face down, while someone tied them up. In at least one of the robberies that the pair were involved in, someone was shot, and in the other one, someone was stabbed. Police would issue polygraphs. The results were not made public. However, police could find nothing linking them to the crime. In October of 1980, Detective Kramer announced that they had a firm suspect in the case. They now believed drugs were involved. Law enforcement received a tip from a reliable source. This person would confirm the known facts to police and additional details that implicated an individual who was on their radar as early as November 19, 1978. Detective Kramer stated the informant's information was very solid. He would go on to say that police know who one of the murderers are. He had no doubt in his mind the suspect can be placed in the woods at the time of the murders. The police believed the murders were over a drug debt of $7,000. This claim was from a conversation Mark Flemings had the night before the murders. He had told friends he had a massive drug debt and would be killed if he could not pay up. This indicated to police Mark was a dealer and not a user. It was a well-known fact that the Crawfordsville Road Burger Chef was frequented by well-known drug traffickers, some of which had ties to large cartels. It was also known these traffickers would have kids sell out of the places they worked, and just two months prior to the murders, police had staked out that particular Burger Chef location as there were many reports of drugs being sold out of the back door and out of the bathroom inside. When Burger Chef's corporate office was notified, they claimed to have no idea that this was going on. Several of the staff said they knew about the drug deals. When the police went to arrest the man, who was now considered their prime suspect, they learned he was no longer living in Indiana and had moved to Florida. When he learned police were after him, he fled to Texas, where the FBI caught him and placed him and his common law wife in jail. Indiana police wanted to extradite him back to Indiana, but because of Texas law, they had to wait. Instead, they took his wife back to Indianapolis with them. While in a Texas jail waiting to be extradited, he was released on bond and fled. It would be two more years before law enforcement caught up with the man and cleared him of any involvement. It seemed police were back to square one. On March 15, 1981, the Freet home would face more woes when James Freet, brother of Jane, was arrested with two other men for selling 30 grams of cocaine. When the public saw his mugshot, they could not help but say how much he resembled the bearded man. When James heard this while in jail, the news made him sick. The fact that people thought he was involved in his sister's murder was just not true. The last time James claims to have seen his sister was a week before she was killed. James also told police he was in the burger chef on November 17, 1978. However, he said when he was there, he never saw his sister or any of the other victims. This would indicate he was in the store on the day shift, or he had been in at some point after the four were abducted. And once more, the case would grow cold. It would be two more years before police would get another break in the case. It came when reporter Dan Lezeter was set to meet with an inmate in December of 1984. The inmate claimed he had a big tip involving the Burger Chef murders. When Dan talked to this man, he wanted help in his case in exchange for the information he was going to give them. The reporter said he would see what he could do. The inmate would give him the names of two men he said was involved in the case. The first man was someone police had dismissed as a suspect early on. The second man was someone the inmate had known since 1970, and he was a former New Whiteland resident, a location very close to where the bodies had been found. This man's name was Donald Ray Forrester. This was a man who police were familiar with and had questioned in the past. Don had also been given two polygraphs and failed both of them. Reporter Dan Lezeter found out that Don's ex-wife had told police in 1979 that she had gone with him to a place near where the murders took place in Johnson County. She told police Don was looking for shell casings along a street near Stones Crossing Road. After finding six shell casings, Don took them home and flushed them down the toilet. After this, he made a phone call to someone. Why did police not investigate this man early on? 
That is something we will never know. On June 24, 1982, Dan Lusiter met with Don. He asked him if he committed the murders. In a calm manner, he simply said, quote, No, I did not. End quote. He then told Lusiter it was drugs and homosexuality. Don would say he knew who did the crime and helped hide some evidence, but that was all. He refused to tell who committed the murders. In July of the same year, Don's ex-wife would give them the name of another man believed to have been involved. The next time Lesseter saw Don, he was going to mention his name and see what he had to say. Before Lesseter could set up an interview with Don, he received a letter from him asking to meet as he wanted to talk about the Burger Chef murders. It took Lesseter a week to get to the prison to talk with Don, and when he arrived, Don no longer wanted to talk about the murders. Don said at the time he really wanted to talk about them, but he had time to think and he no longer wanted to anymore. What Don did not know is that they had recovered shell casings from the septic tank at his old home, which corroborated his ex-wife's story of him flushing the shells. Lesseter would blurt this information out to Don along with the name of the man the ex-wife had given. Don would say, that's him, that's the guy who did it. Now they will know it was me who told. Don would say in the weeks after the murder he was with a man who confessed his involvement to him. By this time, police could not make heads or tails of the information Don was giving them, so in hopes of getting more information out of Don, he was sent to live at a prison work camp where life was not made easy for him by any means. After being on the prison farm for a year, Don would agree to call the man he said committed the murders. From this call, police would learn that Jane and her brother James had been to this man's home on 17th Street. The house was linked to drug trafficking. Police felt this was good information and moved John back to Marion County Jail. After the call, the man who Don claimed to be the killer sprang into action. He called Don's family and asked if he had been released yet. He then called the state police and told them he had been blackmailed and gave police an interview. The man would volunteer to take a polygraph, which he was given and passed. He told police he had nothing to do with the Burger Chef murders. However, he believes that in some way Donald Forrester was involved. The police would also talk with another man Don claimed to be involved with the murders. This man was a friend of the first man, who was the prime suspect before. The man denied any involvement in the murders. He, too, took a polygraph and passed should be noted that polygraphs are not admissible in a court of law. At this point, police realized the only guilty party in this was Donald Forrester. Frustrated with Don's lies, the detectives and the reporter went into the small interrogation room where he was grilled by police. They told him the second man he had named had been in the hospital on the night the murders occurred. Don would ask to speak to the reporter alone. Police were hesitant but agreed. When it was just the two of them in the room, Don leaned forward and began to cry, telling Lesseter he had not told police everything about the Burger Chef murders. Don said he knew the murders were going to happen beforehand, and he was at a meeting three days before the murder took place. During this meeting, the one man Don had named and several others had planned to visit the fast food joint and collect the money for a drug debt. Don told police the drug debt belonged to Jane. The men decided they were going to confront Jane about the debt, and if the money could not be produced, someone was going to pay up one way or another. Don went on to say when the men approached Jane at the restaurant, Mark Flemons intervened where a fight broke out. Mark fell and hit his head on a bumper of the van they were driving. The men were worried he was dead and decided to eliminate the other witnesses. Don claimed the one man he named was involved. Despite him passing a polygraph, Don then gave them a new name. This name went with information police had from another source. Don told all of this to Lesseter. Now the police needed him to tell them. On Monday, November 10, 1986, Donald Forrester told detectives he was ready to come clean about the Burger Chef murders. Don would offer up information only someone at the murder scene would have known. Don outlined the positions of the body and how they were configured. He described the individual wounds on the victim and identified three other people involved. Don also said the gun used to kill Ruth and Daniel was thrown into the White River. Then came the real confession. He told police he was the one who fired the shots that killed Ruth Ellen Shelton and Daniel Davis. A confession, finally what police had needed. 
However, it was short-lived, as one week later Don would recant his confession, claiming detectives threatened him and his family, and they would send him back to the prison farm if he did not confess. The police denied this and said that Donald Forrester knew too much information about the night of November 17th and the morning of November 18th. The police could even tie him to the woods years prior to the murder. In 1969, 18-year-old Donald Forrester would take a 14-year-old young lady into the same woods close to the Burger Chef murder site and rape her repeatedly. Then take her back home where the girl told her parents who immediately reported it to the police. A warrant for his arrest was issued. When he was arrested, he was placed in Johnson County Jail on a $3,000 bond. Donald would never serve one day in jail for his crime. He pleaded out to a reduced charge, and the judge in the case issued a $1 fine and ordered Don to pay a court cost, and placed him on six months probation. When the detectives on the Burger Chef case tried to find anyone who remembered this happening, they could not, nor could they find any paperwork on this, because at the time, the victim was a juvenile. The police still need something to corroborate Don's Burger Chef murder confession. The police spoke to the new people Don named. The first person was an individual police believe stabbed and killed Jane. This suspect was already in Marion County Jail. He denied any participation in the crime. He initially answered questions, but within a few days stopped cooperating with the police. The second person Don named was the leader of a drug ring in Speedway in Avon, Indiana. He was quite the active drug dealer during the murders. He admitted to selling quaaludes, marijuana, and hallucinogenics, but nothing heavier than that, and said he did not sell cocaine. He denied any involvement in the crime. The man called the Independent Star and said he would take a polygraph and truth serum to clear his name and keep it out of the papers. The man would say he didn't do it, and he knew it looked bad, but all of the facts were not known. The paper never published his name, and it has never been released to the public. On November 10, 1986, police would ask Marion County Prosecutor Stephen Goldsmith to bring charges against Donald Ray Forrester for his role in the Burger Chef murders. Police said he was present when the murders occurred and when they were planned. He also admitted to shooting two of the victims. The prosecutor was torn on what to do. On one hand, it would be good to finally charge someone for the crimes. On the other hand, was there enough evidence for a conviction? Don would tell reporters he hoped he was charged as that was the only way for him to prove he was innocent. After a month went by on December 26, 1986, Stephen Goldsmith announced he was not filing charges against Donald Ray Forrester. This was a blow to the police department and the families of the victims. The police still believe Donald Forrester was involved in the murders and he should have went to trial for them. Police believe the crime started out as a cash grab of some kind. It turned into something more when one or more of the crew recognized someone. In an effort to eliminate any witnesses, the crew were abducted and taken to the woods where they were murdered. The police never established a motive for the murders. They said only one true witness came forward from that night, a man working in the Dunkin' Donuts next to the burger chef who claimed to have seen all four employees being abducted. The man then recanted his claim. However, police found this person who was across the street from Burger Chef who placed the witness in the Dunkin' Donuts at the time. If this man saw the employees being abducted, why did he not call police? Was he afraid the killers would recognize him too and he would be murdered as well? The man was never named publicly and we may never know if he knows who took the four that fateful night. All of the parents of the four employees have since passed on. Not a day went by that they did not hope for closure and justice in this case. If you have any information in this case, please call Crime Stoppers at 317-262-TIPS. As always, I'd like to thank you for watching today. And don't forget to hit that like button, share this video, and subscribe so I can continue helping families of the missing, murdered, and unsolved. As always, this is the Oracle signing off.